Reminds me of when I got saved. I saw the light. And the light has a name. His name is Jesus. He is my light. He is my life, my way, my truth. He is my everything. Jesus has become my everything. We look foolish to the world because we're foreigners in this world. Amen. But it won't be long. We'll be leaving and coming back to rule this world. I'm talking about ruling this world. I'm excited about that. You know, I'm not excited about me having a position of, I'm, t- I'm excited about knowing that whatever Jesus says is what's going to happen. Amen. Whatever he says, that's going to be it. And if, and if anybody rebels, there's going to be a price to be paid at that time. Amen. We're living in a different time right now that's going to be during that thousand year reign. Right now, folks are living, just doing whatever they want, and they really think they're getting away with everything, and them nor us are getting away with anything. It's all going to come rushing in right into the footstool of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you go into children's church, now is the time to go. We have great children's church teachers, workers back there. And uh, you know what we believe here at Crossway Church? Uh, You can keep your kids in here if you want to, but uh, they're not allowed to talk and be a distraction. Amen. I don't believe in that. And uh, although other churches may, I don't. And I believe mom and daddy needs to hear the word of the Lord undisturbed so that they can train their children up in the way they should go. Amen. It's really called order and structure. And uh, I just thank God for a little local church here in Cass County, Queen City, Texas, where he's put his hand on a group of people who uh, he's brought to the place of being determined to know nothing else outside of Christ and him crucified. You don't just wake up in that place, my friends. Paul didn't just wake up and say that because, oh, it sounds good. I'll just say that. No, the Apostle Paul had to be brought to the place, and I believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit had to tell Paul, Paul, unless you become determined to know nothing other than that sacrifice, all these things that are pulling on you are going to pull you away. And Paul, I believe, would blurt out, then I am determined to know nothing else. When he would cry out for God to heal him of that thorn in his flesh and God would speak to him and say, my grace is sufficient. Then Paul would say, then I'll just glory right here in my infirmity, in my weakness because I need the power of Christ resting on me more than I need to be delivered from anything, more than I need to be uh, set free from this limp or this thorn in my flesh. I need the power of Christ resting on me. See, that's what we need more than anything. So many people get mad at God. They take it out on the preacher, but, and they quit coming to church. They get mad at God because they didn't get what they thought God ought to give them. They didn't do what they thought God ought to do. This thing ain't about you writing down everything you want and giving it to God and looking for it to happen. If it don't happen, you getting mad and going about your own way. This thing's about you being purchased in your sinful, ugly way of sin and idolatry and wickedness by the blood of Jesus and you saying here I am and I am completely yours whether I get anything can do anything I am yours amen and we've got to walk in that place there are rewards to those that diligently seek the Lord there are blessings but you know what we all are different people amen the Lord Jesus delivered Peter from jail but he let Stephen be stoned So we're all traveling this path, and we're all different. We've all got our faith in one thing, and that's the sacrifice of Jesus. I said we all do. Now most, 99.9% of what's called the church today does not, and it's to that degree. You just need to think about that for a minute. 99% of all that claim to be Christian today, their faith is not in the cross. 
Their faith is in what they're doing or some man somewhere. I fear that even among the cross preaching churches that God has raised up, certain individuals don't think they can get anything from God unless one of their preachers is in the room. There are several churches up in another state. I won't call which one it is, and there are a bunch of them, and they all be claiming to preach the message of the cross, but they won't have any guest speakers unless they come from Baton Rouge. They had me up one time, and three-quarters of the people didn't come, and the reason they didn't come is they said, I thought when we got together we weren't having anybody except from Family Worship Center. See, it's not the truth they're after. It's a man. And I fear even among our ranks, that has happened. Can I remind you this morning that the anointing is not a man. Your Bible in 1 John chapter 2 says, or chapter 1, which one is it? Verse 27 in one of those chapters. The truth, the anointing is the truth. You don't need a certain man. You need the truth. For when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And the truth is the man Jesus and what he did at Calvary. Without that second part, he is not our truth. Our way Our life, our anything without our faith in the cross, he is nothing to you and me but another man. But thanks be to God for the blood that was shed. That man that fully obeyed God laid his life down so that you and I could be brought into the kingdom forgiven, no longer guilty of sin. Children of God, And all this has been done and afforded us through the blood, but by the Holy Spirit. Through the blood, but by the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking in the next sermon or two or three, whatever the Lord wants to do, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because that is who you have here today. You don't have Jesus with you here today. You have the Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Father. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But you do have someone with you that's as much God as the Father and the Son. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. You have Him. People told me through the years, well, if I would have just been on the shores of Galilee with Jesus, things would have been different. No, yeah, they would have been different. You wouldn't have had access to what you have access to now. We have access to more now than you would have had if you would have had been walking on the shores of Galilee with Jesus. Jesus said that, and we're going to turn, first of all, to John 16 this morning. Sister Pam's already quoted it. But we're going to look at it. She made mention of it. In John 16, verse 7, Jesus tells us something profound. And I want you to notice as we read this that he does not say his death or the cross or the sacrifice, but in him saying he must go away, you got to let the Lord remind you this morning how he went away through the cross. So he tells his disciples there in John 16 and 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, that means beneficial and necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. 
Now, we need to understand something this morning, and that's Jesus telling us in that day when he's walking on the earth that it was more important that he go away than he stay here with us. And he would really, I believe, be referring to the way he would go away because unless he go away through the cross, we still couldn't have the comforter. But because he atoned for our sins. How many of our sins? All of our sin. Then the legal right was granted to you and me to be able to have the Spirit of God. The same Spirit of God that led Jesus to the cross, empowered Him to lay His life down, and to taste death for every man by the grace of God. When you see the word grace, you need to always think about the Holy Spirit. Because grace is not happening in your life if the Spirit of God is not moving in your life. When you see the word grace, you know we've taught it over the last year or so here that the word grace, grace really is the words we've heard it before, God's goodness to undeserved people, God's uh, uh, unmerited favor. It's all those things. But never forget this. Never forget this. Those are all good words and good good definitions. But never forget this. God's grace is God at work. If God's not at work, you're not receiving grace. But if you are receiving grace, you're really allowing God to work in your life. See, grace didn't show up to uh, cover our sins. Grace showed up to get us out of sin. Grace saved us from sin. Can I get a witness in here? Grace is God at work. The Bible says we're saved by grace. Who saved us? God. The Bible says in the book of Titus that we're taught by grace. Who's teaching us? God the Holy Spirit. Grace, the Bible says, Paul says, he labored by grace. He labored only by the Spirit of God. Grace is God at work. The first proof you had of that was the moment you believed in Christ and what He did for you at Calvary. God saw your faith and He moved in and He went to work. Amen. Are we good? He moved in and He went to work. When, when you were born again, God moved in and God went to work. The Bible says it is God working in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He did not give you His Spirit to do your will. He's not going to do your will. He gave you His Spirit to do His will, to carry out His will for your life. Amen. And he had to go away because Jesus could only be in one place at one time. He was the man, Jesus Christ. But if he goes away, then he sends the Spirit. The Father gives us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who abides in all of us. Powerful. Could not have happened unless he went away through the cross. When he says, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The comforter. Let's look back at John chapter 14 if we can. And can I ask this question this morning? How many of you know everything? That's what I figured. You in my boat. We don't know everything. You know what that means? That means you could hear something today. You've never heard and learned something. It's also why you need your Bibles when you come to church. Because if you hear something new and you go, hmm, 
It's in the word that you're going to find its confirmation, not in me. It's in the word you're going to find the confirmation, not in the preacher. Amen. Preachers can go astray and lead you astray. Can I get a witness? You're not going to hear many preachers saying that today. But you're going to hear this one saying it because he's been astray. And it's a miracle we stand here today. In John 14 and 16, Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Notice verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. How long you got the Holy Spirit? Oh, he doesn't come and go, does he? You've got the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, living inside of you. We need to become more aware of the God who created all things, who saved us through the giving of His Son. He lives in us today. I said He lives in us today. He is in us today. We're not shouting loud enough this morning. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees Him not, neither knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. Notice this chapter, all through this chapter, it's about those that love him and keep his word. It's about those that love him and keep his word. And he emphatically teaches that if you don't keep his word, you don't love him. Oh, let's keep reading. Verse 21. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now here, he's uh, he's trying to get them at this point to, to understand the Spirit of God that he's going to send. Because just as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he's also telling them here, if you've seen me and known me as the truth, then you'll recognize the Spirit of truth when he comes. That's why God's sheep know the shepherd. God's sheep know the truth. God's sheep follow the shepherd. God's sheep follow the truth. We don't follow everything. We've been sidetracked, but thank God he reached that loving arm out to me in 2003 and said, you've gone the long way, the wrong way, long enough. It's time for you to come back to the cross. And Brother Curtis didn't just say, oh, awesome, that's good. I believe I'll come. No, the Lord had to allow us to go through a period of loss You see, the Lord does give and the Lord does take away. But His purpose in giving and His purpose in taking away is all for our benefit to keep us on this narrow path. And we lost our home, our land, our vehicles, and moved back in with Robin's mother. You've heard the story, and we we felt about that big. But it was in that time that God began to show us You've been off track. You've believed in everything but the blood. You know, we always believed in the blood of Jesus for initial salvation, but then we moved our faith to other things for the way to find the blessings of God and to find God anointing us. And God reminded me, I've never told you I had two ways. I've still only got one way for everything. Only one for your initial entrance, for your way through and out the other side. Only one way. His name is Jesus. And that way is the way of the cross. So he he stops right here and he's telling them, I will love him and will manifest myself to him. To who? Those that love me enough to keep my word. 
What's that mean? Who are they? Who are they that love the Lord enough to keep his word? They that recognize what t- took place on Calvary's hill. You see, because this we've learned also, you can't love God except through the avenue through which he loved you. John 3.16 is a powerful scripture that's more than about God loving you and giving his son. It's also about this, God showing you that's the only avenue which he loves you. He doesn't love me and you outside the cross in some other way. He only loves the world through the cross of his son, through what Jesus did at Calvary. There's the only place you can find God's love, and through faith in that is the only way that you can love God. And if that's what your faith is in today, my friend, you will be found empowered by the Holy Ghost, obeying the word of God. And even when we slip up and stumble and stagger around and see that we're not repentance comes to our heart and we begin again to obey God we are known by the love we have toward each other that's what Jesus taught John 13 35 if you have love one to another then are you my disciples and then the world sees that you're my disciples but disciples Jesus taught cannot exist without taking up a cross daily. And our cross is not our hard times and struggles. Our cross is the cross we died on with him. He died for us. We were crucified with him. And because our faith remains in the sacrifice, when 99% of the church looks at us like a calf looking at a new gate, we stay the course. We cling to the cross. Oh, you should come to our church. God's doing a new thing. We won't be there. I was telling somebody the other day about a few years ago they had here in Atlanta a a big, I don't know what it was called, but it was like they had at the point they kept trying to, a citywide church crusade. It was all about getting people saved and getting the, the, the unchurched in church and those who were and now they're out back in church. And man, there's like 22, 23 churches involved. They kept leaving messages on my phone almost every evening. And, and I wouldn't answer them because I already, God already brought me out of all that mess. And finally, one guy who's somebody in the community showed up at Crossway Church after the service one Sunday morning and a big old guy he's standing there in the foyer and he just wants to know just why won't we get involved why won't came after us why won't you get involved why why do you not want to be a part of this I said well tell me what's going to be going on there I said well they're bringing he he told me they're bringing in rappers for the kids they're going to be some people flying over and jumping out in parachutes and I said see that's what I mean brother I said God took me away from all that we don't need that we need the gospel and that man began to weep right there in the foyer because he knew what I was saying was true but Esau weeped also and it didn't get him anywhere So you can weep all you want, but if you go and you keep being a part of all that that God's not in, that's only got a form but no power, then you're just going to keep on weeping, and you're not going to get anything for your weeping. You don't get anything for your weeping. Your faith is what brings substance into your life, and that being only faith in the cross. They just didn't like them then, and they just don't like us now. But you let it not rain for about 10, 11 weeks around here. Brother Curtis, we need you to come pray with us. And I'll never forget going over and meeting all them preachers in that place. Been a few years ago, it didn't rain. And I got up there, and I preached the cross to them, and I told them preachers, house full of preachers from our region, I said, let me tell you something right now. Unless you're preaching the cross of Christ, you're wasting everybody's time. And then in that evening right there, every preacher in the house was at that altar on their knees crying out to God. You see, that can't happen unless you preach the cross. 
But the message of the cross is not forever once in a while on Sunday. Even when you're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you've got to talk about Calvary or the Holy Spirit's not going to be able to function in your life. God will not honor the best you can do. God will not honor, will not honor your, your good intentions. God only honors the truth. And the truth has a name. His name is Jesus. God only speaks in these last days through His Son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and Hebrews 12, 24 tells us that it's the blood of Jesus that's doing the speaking. That means the message of the cross. If that's not what's in every message, every sermon, it is one without power. See, people won't believe that either today, but yet they'll remain without power. Doesn't matter what you get mad about and believe, you will remain without power. And the devil knows what he's doing. He'll send folks to these churches where there is something there, but it is not the Spirit of God at work. I've already been there. I know it well. The message of the cross is the only message that brings discernment into the child of God's life where he's able to discern no matter what they got, what that looks like. That ain't God because their faith is not in the cross. Amen, Brother Curtis. So he gets them ready here. He says, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Oh, Judas said unto him, and this is not being Judas Iscariot, he said, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, here he, look at what he says again. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's taking place through the Spirit of God being given to us. The manifestation of the Lord is the Spirit of God in your life empowering you because of your faith in the cross. What God did to love you and you loving Him because of that empowering you now to do the Word of God. Not just gather and hear it, but to do it. Can I tell you again this morning that the Holy Spirit is the one, the Bible, the word comforter means the one who comes alongside to help you. Not to do it for you, but to help you. While we're busy sitting at home on the couch talking about our great faith, he's waiting on you to believe again so he can go to work again and help you. See, he was sent to help you, not move you and do it to help you. The Bible says we're co-laborers. Yes, you hear my voice this morning, <coughs> maybe, but the Lord is ministering through me this morning to remind you that he gave you his spirit, his spirit, because you love him so that you could obey him. Not so God didn't give us his spirit so we could start right, making up excuses as to why we're not in church. We don't give. We don't pray like we ought. We don't study the word. All the things we've been told emphatically to do, and we shout the preacher down, amen, but then we leave and we're not doing them. He didn't give us his spirit to grieve his spirit. Every time we know to do right and we do it not, the Bible calls it what? sin and what are we what are we doing telling the lord no i don't need your help in this because if i'll receive his help he's going to empower me to do the will of god if i'm not doing what i know to do is right i'm telling the lord i don't need your help i got this and we're get grieving him and if he is grieved it's because we're not believing what he is trying to get me to believe you see, the spirit of truth will only teach you truth and only lead you in the truth you allow him to teach you. You understand? Let me say it again. The spirit of God is God. Jesus is God. 
They're all three God. We only have one God. But he's manifest to us in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's one God. And all three persons of the Godhead are God. So the one living in you is the spirit of the one who said, let there be light. The one living in you is the spirit of the one who endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. The one living in you is the spirit of truth. The one that was sent to comfort you by teaching you truth, not comfort you with a Kleenex, not comfort you with a physical hug, but to comfort you with the Scriptures as Jesus said they're concerning Him. If we're trying to be comforted some other way than through the Scriptures, then we're looking for somebody else to do the comforting, whether we realize it or not. God, the Holy Spirit, comforts us through the truth revealed. And the truth is a man, Jesus. And I know people say, well, brother, the whole Bible's truth. Yes, but only if it's in the context of the man who said, I am the truth. And what it took to make him the truth for us. If it leaves the cross or Jesus out, either one, it's not truth. If you leave the cross out, it's not applicable truth, although it's true. Jesus said the Scriptures were written about Him. And this Spirit of God that you have received upon your initial faith in what Jesus did at Calvary, the Lord wants more for you. He wants you to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be filled. And if you've been filled, He wants you to be filled again. You see, the Lord came to die for us so we could be saved. And when we're saved, we could be filled. And when we're filled, then we can be used according to his plan. And then when we're being used, he's being glorified. And then that just starts all over again. Somebody else can be saved and filled. And used so that somebody else can be saved and filled and used. See, what we read in the book of Acts is a story about the Holy Spirit acting through filled people. Filled people. Now, we don't run people off because they don't believe in the baptism. Oh, no, we don't run people off for any reason here. But the reason people run off... <laughs> One of the main reasons people run off is because they just don't know what to do with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It won't save you from your sins. It'll, it'll, it'll prepare you and equip you, empower you. Let me use that word. The Holy Spirit empowers for the work of the ministry. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, got in the flesh and had to be corrected. Just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean that you're going to get it all right. It takes faith in the cross and being filled with the Holy Spirit, and it takes it every day. It takes it every day. Every day. I know people who are, have been baptized with the Holy Spirit and they're just as miserable today, just as miserable today, just unhappy today. You know what they need? First of all, they need to examine themselves and make sure their faith is what they think it's in. Because when our faith literally is in Calvary, that ignites us on the inside by His Spirit. 
Do you remember what it was like the first time you heard the message of the cross after being captured by false doctrine for many years? Not the first time you heard it. The first time you heard it, you probably, like me, turned it off. <laughs> Said, why are they preaching that? I'm further along than the cross. But the first time you grabbed a hold of it, or let me say it this way, the first time the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of you, and you, like the song says, you saw the light again. See, there's no light for you outside of Calvary. You need daily light. That's why Jesus taught you need a daily cross. But it's only the Holy Spirit who can give you the light you need. But the Holy Spirit, who is God, He can't work in your life without your faith in the truth. He can't work in your life without your faith in the cross. See, that's what they really don't like right there. But until a man gets honest with himself again and realizes, comes to himself and says, okay, I'm just going to believe God's Word. I don't care. I'm not judging what's right based on any experience I've had. I'm judging what is right based on the Word of God. And God says this in Psalms 33, 4, For the word of the Lord is right, and all my works are done in truth. All my works are done in truth. Outside of truth, you won't find God working. The disciples are walking along with Jesus. He's taking them, and he's headed to Jerusalem. He turns around and tells them where he's headed, and Peter says, I don't think so. That's not a good place to be going right now. They'll kill you. Jesus stopped and corrected Peter in an abrupt, rough kind of way, in a way that if most today were talked to that way, they'd say, well, I don't believe in him anymore. He called me the devil. I ain't following him. He's probably the devil. Today, all it takes is the preacher not hugging somebody. They're out of here. You laugh, but let me tell you something. They have no faith. They may have had, but they have no faith. If you're looking for a hug from the preacher, oh, if you're looking for something other than somebody pointing you to Calvary, you need to examine yourself. Because you've surely stopped looking at what gives you light to see. The only way that you can have eyes to see, Jesus told Nicodemus, is if you're born again. You can't enter the kingdom or even see it till you're born again. That means the moment you believed in Christ, the Holy Spirit enlightened you. He was already talking to you, telling you the truth. And when you believed it, the light came on. He turned it on for you. You need that light every day. The Holy Spirit is here to teach us the truth. To lead us into all truth. The only place that He, who is God, the Holy Spirit, will work in our lives. Do you see how basic that is? How kindergarten that is? But men and women out there all over the earth are going to say, I don't believe that. There are people, there's a, there's a family who was going to this church for at least a year and a half who says, I don't want to hear anything about that anymore. See, they didn't get something they were after. See, God is not a, a little ball you can rub on and get what you want. It doesn't matter your condition today. It doesn't matter your predicament today. God still loves you, and he'll lead you into truth if you'll believe truth. We're going to be talking more about this in the days ahead. We're going to be talking more about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as we close, I want, to, I want us to turn to the book of Acts, if we can, right quick. And, 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 and what I was going to say earlier concerning, uh, you know, we don't run people off. Listen, as long as you believe the baptism is, to, is for today, as long as you're not bucking that, then you're going to be fine here. 
You ain't going to be fine here if you start bucking that that's not for you, that's not for today. That's, I mean, I'm going to tell you something, that's a big lie. Peter stood up on Pentecost and gave the message, and he said, this is not only for them, but this is for you, your children, your children's children, and all those who are called of God. And we've learned in the last year, actually, what happened at Pentecost. Isn't that something? All these years been saved and all these years been preaching the cross. And just within the last year or year and a half, we, the Lord has taught us something really new that we didn't really understand that what happened on Pentecost. You see, they weren't born again till Pentecost because they didn't have the Spirit of God till Pentecost. And what happened in that upper room, the Spirit of God showed up and moved in them first and saved them and then baptized them all most at the same time with the Spirit of God. You understand that? They did not have the Spirit of God dwelling on inside of them until Pentecost. But God saved them on that day. That's when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God moved inside of them, and then almost simultaneously, right after that, again, he baptized them with the Holy Spirit, with the physical initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. So, yes, as a Christian, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't help what mom and dad and brother and sister and co-workers don't believe. I can't. I said once again, we're Bible believers. You need to read the book of Acts and don't go ask no questions. Just believe it. Because, see, there's two periods of time with God. There's before the cross. There's after the cross. There's not before the cross, a little bit after the cross, and now us. No, there's before the cross and after the cross. And after the cross, God sent his spirit to save us through the truth we would believe when he told us about Jesus and what he did at Calvary, and to baptize us with the Holy Ghost, with the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you hadn't spoken in other tongues, you're not filled with the Spirit. You're not baptized with the Spirit according to the Bible. Now, there are churches and preachers out there because more and more people are being baptized with the Holy Spirit today. I mean, it's being preached less and less, but there are people still being filled, and this Spirit-filled movement of God, most of them are not in the faith, but you can be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Oh, it's quiet around here now. We weren't preaching the cross. We weren't listening to the message of the cross, and we got baptized with the Holy Ghost and went to speaking in other tongues because it's a promise to who? Saved people. Not if, not if you're called to leadership, not if you're anything. If you're saved and you hear and believe the message that God sent his son to die for you and you're born again, then now you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Look in the book of Acts in chapter 19. And it came to pass, verse 1, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Everybody say he found some disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Apparently he found some followers of John. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now get ready. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's talking about a, a baptism into the death of Jesus. Romans 6, 3 tells us that, that as many as have been, as many as have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death. When they heard this, 
that the one John had preached had come, Paul told them they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. Paul didn't say, hey, y'all got to call a ministry on your life. You really need this baptism. Paul just told them about Jesus. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether that's talking about water baptism or the other baptized into his death, if they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized into his death. The Bible here doesn't really say, but I believe that they were baptized into his death. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Here we, what we have right here is a group of people who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but not until Paul laid his hands on them were they baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Same thing happened at Pentecost, except nobody laid their hands on them. They believed they were there waiting on the promise Jesus said was going to be sent by the Father. And when the Spirit of God came, he moved inside them, and they were born again. They were the, they were the new covenant, born again church started right there. Because until that point, you could be a follower of Jesus, but you couldn't have his Spirit until he'd gone away and sent the Spirit back. And Pentecost is the day the Spirit of God came back, moved in, and baptized those believers in the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues, all of them. You know what the Bible says. You're going to need this baptism. This is not a, this is not a, a uh, just option B if you'd like to have it. This is Jesus commanded them to be filled with the Spirit. You're going to need, you need to just let the dignity thing go. I'm too dignified. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, speaking in tongues, what will they think about me? What's the Lord going to think if you deny one, the greatest gift for a born-again child of God? What do you, what's the Lord going to think? You, you're denying my, what I want to do in your life for you, through you, simply because of what people will think about you? Aren't you glad I didn't care about that when I went to the cross for you? See, this is something you need. This is something you need, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, prophesying. You can't show me anybody in the body of Christ today that has the gifts of the Holy Spirit functioning in them and through them that has not been filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not there. It's not happening. You say, well, I've known big, I've known great preachers. Anybody can get up and read the Word of God. You have the Spirit of God, but the prerequisite for ministry, according to the book of Acts, is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And how many of you know we all got ministry? May not be pulpit, may not be teaching Sunday school, but we all call to ministry the ministry of reconciliation. But this baptism... Doesn't mean now you've got it all right. Remember, the Apostle Paul had to stand Peter straight up and say, you're wrong. What you're doing is wrong. And Peter had to repent, even though being full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how many churches do you know who are setting deacons in because they're the mayor, they're the jewelry store owner, they're the, they're, they're the guy who runs all this and the bank owner, and they put these guys in. Deep. But the Bible criteria for being a deacon is that you be full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. He says, look out among you who you saved ones and find those who are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom and set them in as deacons. You see how far we can get off from the Bible if we get away from Calvary? See, if we're not preaching Calvary, that means we've lost our boldness. We've become ashamed. We're, we're, we're being slidden right into the world and don't even know it. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you have been, you need to be refilled. Acts 4 tells of the early church who they're being ridiculed, they're being criticized. You see all these bad things happening in the world? You, look, you better get ready. You better get ready. Worse and worse things are going to happen. Laws are going to change. Our Constitution is going to change. How could that be happening to America without God? 
A nation that doesn't want God gets what? Everything outside of what God wants to provide. And horrible things are going to begin to take place worse and worse and worse. That's what the Bible teaches, waxing worse. Those who are walked in the truth with us are going to be seduced by doctrines of devils, just like Joseph Prince and, and all those people teaching that you don't have to repent anymore. You, you don't have a sin nature. You, you, the rapture, it, it, it's not going to happen. And we're all, I mean, all this garbage out there, unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit and hanging on to Calvary, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. But here's the good news. If your faith remains in Calvary, you're going to want everything Calvary provided for you, and you are going to make it. I'm going to say that again. If you hang on to Calvary, and some of you watching online today, you're watching this message, but Sunday morning, you're in a church not preaching the cross, not focused on the cross because of your husband or your wife or your friends. That's out of the will of God. I don't mind telling you because I love you enough to tell you. I'm not condemning you. I'm just bringing the word of the Lord to you. Jesus said, if you put anybody in front of me, you can't be my disciple. And you can't be his disciple unless you take up your cross and follow him. And you're surely not doing that unless you're listening to a preacher preaching this message. But we're more concerned about our status in the community our financial status, our status in the community, what they're going to think about us. Let me tell you something. The cross Jesus endured, it didn't matter what people thought. He went and did it anyway. And he's calling you to the same, to forget what everybody's thinking. None of my family, none of my wife's family is in this church because they hadn't grasped this truth yet. That's not being ugly. That's just the way it is. They know what it takes to get saved, but none of them know what it takes to live saved. And if we don't stand our ground, how are they ever going to know? If we don't stand our ground, how is anybody else going to hear? God, this is not some little fly-by-night gathering you're in this morning. This is a church that started 11 years ago when we were scared half to death, not knowing how we'd preach the message of the cross for the rest of our lives. But I tell you, God's been here, and God's been doing it, and God's been adding, and God's been building, and God's been a blessing to this region. They don't expect you to make it because you're not doing what they're doing. But here's reality. They're not going to make it because they're doing what they're doing. The only people who are going to make it who cling to Calvary. Cling to Calvary. What does that mean? I just sit around and talk the cross all day. No, it means that you don't allow your faith to be in anything else. You don't allow yourself to be pulled away from those places, wherever that is the Lord has planted you in the house of the Lord that's preaching nothing, pointing to nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Nothing else do we need to hear about. Nothing else do we need to learn about. Let me tell you something. Just because we got filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit in a place that wasn't preaching the cross, here's what I know. We didn't stay filled long at all. You can't stay filled outside the faith. You can get filled because it's a gift, but you ain't staying filled. You're not staying filled. What, I mean, what's the purpose of being filled if you're not walking in the truth? So all those people out there who got baptized with the Holy Ghost and God moved upon them, but yet they're not hearing the message of the cross, they, they're rejecting it. How can they stay filled? How can they stay filled? Because now their faith is in something other than what it took for them to be able to be filled in the first place. You know what I'm talking about. We need to be filled. Some of us work in secular jobs and People just, they don't believe anything. Some believe lots of weirded out things and think, well, God's going to honor what I believe. At least I'm believing something. Well, only those who are filled with the Spirit are going to be able to stand up day 
after day after day. Not every once in a while when they get mad and they've had enough. You know, every once in a while, some Christian on the job, uh, they'll just have enough, and that's all I'm not listening to. Her, her, no, and, and they do it out of anger. Only those who are filled with the Holy Spirit are going to day after day be able to say, well, the Bible says, well, the Bible says, I'm going to tell this and then I'm going to close. You've heard it before, but God's got you here to tell the truth. Live the truth. Tell the truth. And years ago, I worked on this job, and we were all on break, and this woman began to say in there around all those people that were in the break room how they're about to prove that homosexuality is, we're born with that. We're born homosexuals and lesbians. And I said, oh, no, they'll never prove that. Oh, yes. And when it was kind of nice and pleasant at first, and she said, oh, yes, 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 scientists, they've they, they done found a gene that's in the genes. And I said, oh, no, they'll never prove that. And it starts getting a little worse each time. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard it on the news. Now, doctors and scientists, they're, uh, they, they've done come up with this. And I said, well, they'll never prove it. Well, they're, they're almost there proving it now. <laughs> I said, well, the Bible says, and we were all sitting around this long table. And I said, well, the Bible says, and when I said the Bible says, every head in the place bowed <laughs> except one woman across from me. See, that's all you had to do, pull the sword out. Sword of the Spirit, the Word of the Lord. I didn't have a clue what I was going to say. I said, oh, Lord, what have I said? I done stepped in and don't have nothing to say. And the Lord spoke through me right there on the job, and he said, the Bible says, God says in his Word in Psalm 127 that children are his inheritance. And the Bible says that abomination, that homosexuality and lesbianism is an abomination to him. So why would God have an inheritance unto himself that was an abomination? It was over. It was over. And that opened the door for me to be able to tell some more people some things the Bible said. Because people are running around out there everywhere believing all kind of stuff, just waiting on you to point them to Calvary. And let me tell you something about the power of the gospel. They don't have to be in a church to hear it, to get saved. All they got to do is somebody tell them Jesus died on a cross to atone for our sins. That's the power of God you just unleashed on them. You just opened the door. The Holy Spirit just spoke through you and gave them the truth that he'll work in if they'll believe it. That's it. Thank God they come to church. Thank God they come to hear more. But you know what? All they need to do to have the power of God put in their face is you tell them, Jesus loved you enough. He died for you so you could be forgiven and delivered from all your sin. All your sin. then they have to deal with that truth. And if they accept it, God moves in and God goes to work. If they deny it, then they take off running and God takes off running after them. That's the way it works. Because once you hear that power, that truth, you might turn your back and you might run from it, but you're never getting rid of it. You can't get rid of it. As we ministered here recently, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. Because he went to the cross, every man, woman, and child today that's breathing is being drawn. What they're doing with the drawing is a different story. But they are being drawn. Stand with me this morning. As the musicians and singers come this morning, if you're here this morning and you've dried,